Hi everyone, my name is Monique. And I'm Naveen from Before You Play. And welcome to episode one of our new talking segment called uh, Let's Talk Board Games. Yeah, we normally come out with uh, one talking segment a month. It's our blog. And so we're doing something <laughs> a little bit different here. Uh, we kind of don't really know what we're doing. Uh, but yes. we figured <laughs> you got to start sometime. So here we are. That's true. And so this segment was actually born because, you know, first and foremost, we realized that we cannot cover every game. Yeah. We have these games that get sent to us and also games that we just want to talk about. And uh, our content on our channel is primarily long form. Mm -hmm. You know, we do playthroughs yep. and we don't have all the time to make playthroughs for every single thing. But we, we want to talk about them. Yeah, or sometimes right? there's games that uh, we play it and we're like, yeah, OK, uh, I don't know how well that's going to be engaging for the audience to watch yeah. you know, a playthrough. So sometimes uh, a playthrough does not translate well, we think, into a video that, that you guys would kind of consume. So true. this is kind of a little bit different so that way we can still cover games, but not, you know, dedicate hours and hours to each and individual one. Right. Also, our vlog is primarily used for talking about things coming up on our channel. Right. And so when we have kind of any kind of news or just things that we want to talk about that we've been hearing around the board gaming industry, we don't really have a way to communicate that with our audience. Mm -hmm. So this is hopefully gonna happen once or twice a month, depending on how spicy we're feeling. <laughs> if you kind of get through the segment and have any ideas as to what you would like to hear from us, uh, specifically on this segment, then uh, please feel free to leave a comment down below and we will we'll read everything, so. Yeah, we'll try to take it into account and then uh, we can kind of evolve mm -hmm. this segment along with uh, our community. Yeah, exactly. And so the general idea as to what these episodes are going to be like is we are going to be talking a little bit about news, just yep. things that we've been maybe have been on our mind to start off and then Board maybe go into a topic of discussion mm -hmm. before we go into like really quick format reviews. Right. So we're, we're going to maybe cover around four games an episode. I know there are four of them that we're going to be doing uh, today. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to leave timestamps down below in case you'd like to jump around to the different segments. Or if you're just interested in just hearing about this specific game, you can jump around uh, to that section. And also stay tuned. We are going to be doing a little mini giveaway. There's a couple games that we have. Uh, and at the very end, we'll kind of tell you exactly what we're going to give away. Yes, just to kind of celebrate the, the inauguration <laughs> sure. of our first episode. Sure. First and foremost, we wanted to wish everybody out there a happy Pride Month, since it is still mid-June. It's June, yep. Yes, traditionally, we like to attend the festivities around uh, our city and all that, but as California is still in the process of opening up, we are just kind of celebrating on our own. But we do want to recommend a video that uh, that I watched recently and quite enjoyed. And this is a video from Thinker Themer, who is one of our favorite board gaming mm -hmm. YouTube channels out there. And they kind of shared some personal um, coming out stories. And I just found it very, it was a very good video and uh, very touching. And I just want wanted to share that with all of you so that you can check it out as well. So we'll leave a link to their video in the description below and uh, check out their channel while you're at it. So another news, this is uh, this is actually global news. It just uh, doesn't only deal with board games and there is a worldwide shipping slowdown or crisis going on right now. Yeah, big time. Uh, prices are going up. I've heard anywhere from three to 10 times what they normally would go for. Uh, containers, there's a basically a container shortage going on um, and that's caused by uh, containers that are sitting out at sea that cannot come into the ports. And then for that reason, there's no containers kind of in circulation. Uh, I work with a lot of people that, that work at the docks, actually. That, that's kind of what I do uh, as, as part of my job. And uh, they tell me that there's a bunch of ships just parked in the port of Los Angeles just waiting to come in. And it's been like that for months. And so now we're kind of seeing this backup nice. uh, that's causing this big, big problem. So uh, that means there's going to be delays in Kickstarters getting fulfilled and shipped on time. Uh, there might be price increases in board games because that shipping cost goes up. So uh, publishers either have to eat that cost or they have to pass that cost along to the consumers. So it's just something to be aware of. Uh, try to be as uh, patient as possible, especially with those Kickstarters that you've been waiting, I know, for more than a year sometimes. Uh, but it is kind of the nature of the beast. It's kind of what we're living with. And yeah. it's just something that we wanted to bring light to. I'm pretty sure there are other factors, you know, that we don't even know about. Yeah. You know, there are so many things kind of going on in the on the publisher side of it uh, that is making them pull out their hair. But they're doing their best. Mm -hmm. And so all we ask is that everybody just practices some kindness and patience and and uh, trust that everybody's kind of working towards the greater good of the community. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, so before we get started with our actual reviews, we do want to kind of talk about maybe a topic uh, each time we have these episodes. Mm -hmm. And so our topic today is very simple. What do you look for in a reviewer? 
-hmm. I don't think we've ever asked specifically our audience that before. And so this is an interesting topic for us because up until now, like, yes, we do review games at the end of, of a lot of our playthroughs. Mm -hmm. Playthrough and review. So it's the <laughs> second part. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. But I don't necessarily think that I would consider us primarily reviewers. It's definitely why it's second. It's the playthrough part is, yes. is what we do. Uh, Monique says that we are showcasers of we're, games. We're like showcasers. Yeah, we and... look for games that we think would be cool or we play games that we think are really fun and think, okay, this would make a great playthrough. And then we yep. showcase them and we do the emphasis. The emphasis is definitely on teaching the game and kind of showing how what plays, yeah. the beauty of this game is right yeah exactly yeah so we like to obviously do full playthroughs mm -hmm. and then we finish off with kind of that discussion slash yeah. review at the end uh but our main focus is that playing of the game yes and that's kind of uh kind of where we like to go so obviously when, there's content creators who are specifically focus on reviews mm -hmm. uh and then there's all you know all sorts of different content creators but when you look at kind of like the tree of content creators, the first branch is reviewer. Right. And so we're just kind Probably. of curious as to like, what is it that you all look for in a reviewer? Yes, and what so, do you value? Exactly. And uh, what the main reason why we want to know this is because this segment is going to be focusing specifically on reviews. So this is something that we're going to have to think about more and more. Right. And we definitely want to take uh, your opinions into consideration when we approach these games. Yes. Part of the reason why we don't primarily do reviews is because there's a huge responsibility. There's a lot of baggage that comes yeah. along uh, being a reviewer of any sort, I would say. Totally. But specifically in the board gaming community, you know, in order to be a reviewer, you have to play a lot of games. Mm -hmm. And anybody who is a content creator in this space most likely already does. Right. Right? Yeah. And so that in itself comes with this baggage of having to review for the wide gamut of different gamers who are going to be watching your review. Mm -hmm. So there is a significant amount of bias. And this bias specifically has to do with the amount of games that you are exposed to as a mm -hmm. reviewer. Yep. It kind of desensitizes you to the different mechanics that are, you know, it's, there's a lot of like, oh, I've already seen that, you know, that's nothing new. But for somebody who is just joining the hobby, like we have people who uh, comment on our videos sometimes who just started playing board games last week. Mm -hmm. And so to yep. them, if this is the first worker placement game that they have ever played, it might be just like knock their socks off. So we have to be cognizant about their experience just as much as we need to be cognizant of somebody who's played 30 worker placement games, yeah. right? Yeah, because most games that come out, I would say are a re-implementation of mechanics that we already know. Mm -hmm. It's very rare or every so often do we get something that's like, this is innovative. This yeah. is completely different. It's so just very hard to do it's, that. It's very hard to yeah. do that, you know, to be very innovative. And so, um, like Monique said, you know, we we, tr we at least as reviewers, um, we try to kind of cater our reviews to the wider audience of different gamers. So mm -hmm. we try to say like, okay, this game is good for this reason because of X, Y, and Z, yeah. which is helpful for maybe a newer gamer and also helpful if you listen to the language for an experienced gamer. If right, that makes right, sense. right, right, right. And that can sometimes come off as being a little bit too positive. Because in my opinion, every game that is made out there, even if you think it's terrible, there it's gonna have an audience somewhere. somewhere Somebody's yeah. going to like this game. And so for us, we, we tend to approach uh, any kind, anytime we review a game, we tend to approach it in the sense of who does this game serve, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So we're more of like a practical reviewers, I guess. Who does it serve? But, and then we try to speak to that audience. That is that is a whole background as to why we this, this topic has been kind of crossing our minds lately. So we would love to hear what your thoughts are, uh, what you look for in a reviewer. Do you look for uh, reviews that are extremely critical? Yeah, do you look for somebody that explains the game very, very well? Are you looking for something very, very concise? So just kind of what are the different things that you look for in a reviewer specifically? Let us know. All right, so now on to the games. We yes. have four games that we're gonna be talking about four today, games. starting with a cute little, I guess, is it like a filler? Would you I, say this definitely a filler, a filler game? yes, yeah. So this is a game called Mass Transit, and it is a small box game. This is my hand for scale. Uh -huh. And it is designed by uh, Chris Leader and Kevin Rogers, published by Calliope Games. So yeah. this is a cooperative transportation game. Fully cooperative transportation game. Uh, essentially what's going on in this game is there are six different workers that are starting in the central board or in the city. Mm -hmm. And each one of them has to go on uh, various different directions from the city to the suburbs, to their homes. And yeah, so you gotta get them home. You gotta get them home. It's rush hour. <laughs> there are three different lines that you have to get them through. There's a rail line, a bus line, or a uh, waterway or canal. Mm -hmm. And you have to play cards in order to get them to their homes. Yes, so each player is gonna have 
have a hand of cards. And these cards are going to, to show either the three modes of transportation, which is what Naveen was detailing, or yeah. it'll show the, the actual house that right. you have to uh, put at the very end of one of the legs, right. right? And the houses tell you how many cards are required to be uh, laid out before you place the house down. Right. But essentially, the cards are slightly multi-use because you can either put them down to lay track to allow these, these commuters to... To travel the distance that's required yes. to get to their home. Or you can discard the card to move the commuter via one of those transportation ways. Exactly, yeah. There's a, there are a few more rules to that in terms of uh, how to move the actual commuter. Like commuters can only move through one mo mode of transportation unless they come to a station. Yep. And then they can kind of switch modes of transportation. Right. But uh, like if they have a transfer. So like yes. uh, the first two cards, they're moving on the waterways. Yes. They find themselves at a station. Now they transfer to a bus line exactly. and that bus line is going to now take <laughs> them home. And so the way you do all this is by hand management. Uh -huh. And uh, the one thing about this is because it's co-op, there is limited communication. So you cannot openly communicate what's in your hand and exactly, you know, how you're going to move one commuter from one line to another or, yeah. you know, and different things like that. So there's a very, very big hand management aspect of this game. What did you think of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard, actually. Uh, it's really you know, hard. <laughs> you know, we have played it a handful of times and I don't think we have ever won. No. We've always come down to game. like the last card where it's like, we don't have the, the right color in our hand. We, we, yeah. we blew through them. And so uh, it's, it's tough. Um, I could not imagine it at six players how you would be able to manage the hand properly in the right I sequence. I imagine it would be awesome, but it would probably be even harder. Yeah. Uh, it is hard because there are only a certain number of cards that show... The type of track and the color. Yes, and there are also only a certain number of cards that show a, a form of transportation. So, for example, you might have a blue card that allows you to move via the waterway, but if you use that as track, instead of spending it to move the commuter via yep. the waterway, you're gonna run out of those blue cards. And so if you kind of rely on everybody moving through the waterways, mm -hmm. you'll run out and then right. your commuters won't all make it home because right. they all have to get home yes. before people run out of cards in order to win this game. The tricky thing is uh, you start with a hand of four cards and you must play at least two of those cards uh, on your turn. You could play more than that, but if ever there's a moment in the game where you cannot play two cards, everybody loses automatically. And so I think this game is really cute. Uh, you know, when you lay it out on the board, just that like progression of, of the cards looks really neat. It takes up a lot of space. It does, it does take up a lot of table space for how small this is because yes. uh, from out from the city, there are six different branches. Yeah. And so as you start adding cards in all the different directions, uh, this is probably not something you could take traveling. Maybe unless you have like a lot of space yeah, wherever no, you're I going. I think you can. Just don't play it on the bus. <laughs> don't play right? it on the bus. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, definitely a family weight game. It says ages well, eight and up, yeah. and that's that's probably about right. That's about right. Yeah. 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 I like it. It's a yeah. very fast game. It says about twenty minutes. Uh, twenty minutes. That's about yeah, right. total. fifteen to twenty minutes. I would say. So yeah. definitely a, definitely a filler type. Feels pretty unique to play. Yeah. After so. the first time we played it, we failed miserably, and I instantly wanted to play it a second time and be like, yeah, okay, yeah, now, yeah. now I know a little bit better. So that second play is definitely. Uh, more significant than the first one. Actually, the first time we played, we played it incorrectly and we won and then reread the rule book and we're like, no, actually we lost. That, yeah, so that's why <laughs> I was like, okay, lost. knowing what so, I know, yeah, that's yeah. right, that's right. So anyway, that is Mass Transit. Um, I believe it is part of a line of these kind of like smaller box card games yep. by Calliope Games. So if this sounds interesting to you, check it out. All right, next up, we have the new expansion for Fantasy, Fantasy Realms. Realms. And so this expansion is called the Cursed Horde. Uh -huh. And so if you're not familiar with Fantasy Realms, this is a game that uh, historically I have really adored as a filler type card game. Monique's a big fan of it and I am not a big fan of it. Yes, that is our background <laughs> with Fantasy Realms. Yeah. Uh, this game is actually has actually been nominated for a Spiel des Jahres award. It is, yeah. It's in like the strategic category. The Kenner Spiel, yeah. Which is interesting. That's it. I just think that that is an interesting uh, choice selection, selection yeah. for mm -hmm. the award, but we will see uh, kind of how that progresses. You know, even though we're in content creation, I had no idea that you can win or be nominated for a game outside of the year that it was published. I thought it was... Yeah. I had no idea. I don't know. We didn't know. I, I don't know. It's what it is, because I think this game came out several years ago. Uh, the original one did. Yes. They recently did a, a reprinting with different art, and so we yep. have both of them here to show you. This is our original copy that mm -hmm. I have played a lot. It's yeah. kind of worn, and I think this came out in... 
2017. 2017, yeah. And so this is the newer one that right. they had sent us. The only difference is the box art. And so if you're not familiar with this game, the way that the game works is each player has a hand of cards. And so the cards in this deck are going to be they're gonna have a lot of different uh, information. information printed yeah. on them. Yeah. They're a part of different factions, they're worth a certain number of points. The entire purpose of the game is you're curating a hand of cards because at the very end of the game, you're going to reveal your entire hand and you're going to see how they kind of combo with each other. Mm -hmm. Cards will say stuff like, this is worth 50 points, but if you pair it, with a beast or something like that, it's going to be minus 30 points or right, something. Right. So you're trying to figure out what combination of cards uh, will go well together so you can score the maximum number of points at the end of the game. Right. Now, uh, the actual gameplay is very simple. You draw a card and you discard one. Yep. So you can either draw from the discard that's on the table or you can draw from the deck. Right. But uh, as you discard, you're going to see a growing amount of discards on the table in front of you. And then once a certain amount of cards have been discarded, that is how the game ends. It's right. Very fast. Yeah. So there is an interesting part there where it's like there's something really nice out there on mm -hmm. the table, but you really want the game to end. So you kind of want to say, OK, well, maybe I'll just draw from the top deck yes. so I can end the game by, by tossing a card into the dead center pile. Yeah. Uh, that way you can kind of speed up the game. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of metagaming yeah. in this. This is also the game, if you are familiar with the Red Rising board game that Stonemaier came out with, it is also the game that it, that game has been based off of mechanically. Modeled after this, yeah. Modeled after. And so uh, we do get this question a lot. Now that we've played both, or that game specifically, a lot, and we've actually recently played it at the highest player count, I definitely enjoy Fantasy Realms a lot more, quite a bit more sure. than that one. And so the new expansion comes with two main uh, new things. It mm. introduces three new factions, which are the the buildings, outsiders, and undead. Undead, yep. And so that's just a new, you know, more variety of cards. I know the undead specifically gives you points depending on what's in the discard in the area. discard, yes. So that's new. Uh -huh. So it just adds a little bit more uh, in terms of strategy. The curse part of it are these new curse cards. And right. so I think that that is kind of like a main part of the game. Players have one of these curse cards in front of them at all times. And so on your turn, you can choose to ignore it if you want to and just like don't do anything with these cursed items. That's what I did. Or you can discard <laughs> them to exchange them for other ones. For a different one. But yeah. they're all worth negative points if you choose to use them. Yep. But usually the power on the card is pretty strong. Yeah, you it's, can justify using it. You're like, okay, I'm willing to take negative five points because mm -hmm. I like whatever this power is on here. Yes, and the whole purpose of these cursed cards is just for you to do the main point of the game better. So it allows you to, you know, maybe look for a card that you need mm -hmm. or, um, give you the ability to cater that hand better, but at a cost, right? Because they're cursed. And so that is a very small box expansion. What are your thoughts from somebody who is not too keen on the base game? What did you think of the expansion? So some expansions, uh, just in general in board gaming, uh, enhance a game, some mm -hmm. kind of give it fluff. This one is just kind of right in the middle for me. It, it, it doesn't uh, change mechanisms at all in the game, which I always appreciate in an expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it didn't do anything to like be like, okay, now this game makes it amazing for me. <laughs> yeah. So it you know, just fair. adds more factions, which is like staying staying in line with what the game is. And yeah. then these, these cursed cards, uh, it's to a point where you can just ignore it. And then mm -hmm. it's like, well, you're just playing Fantasy Realms. So, it's true. so for me, it, you know, it didn't do anything to kind of elevate it in, in the position of my head. How about yourself? I actually agree with that. That yeah. is a pretty uh, spot on analysis for me. So for yeah. the both of us, when it comes to expansion specifically, we used to be those, uh, you know, collectors. Yeah, we used yeah. to we used to look up games, expansion specifically, and like any expansion for a game that we love, we would just auto buy. Yeah. And uh, you know, not all expansions are great, is yeah. what we realized, or not all expansions are completely necessary. There are some out there that are totally like, I would not play this game without this expansion. And those are really the ones that we look for. Yep. So I would agree for somebody who really enjoys the base game of Fantasy Realms, this is also kind of like a middle ground for me. Um, if we have it, why not play with it? Because yeah. you can ignore the cursed cards. Yep, you totally exactly. can. But if you happen to have one that's great, you can also use it. It does throw a little bit of spice into yeah. the gameplay. I will say um, I do enjoy the uh, the undead faction. The, mm -hmm. the fact that you're trying to curate the face-up uh, discard pile, yeah. that is kind of cool. It doesn't necessarily add to the heart of why I like Fantasy Realms. You could just you could play without the expansion. I would still like Fantasy Realms the same, probably, mm -hmm. as yep. if I were to play with the expansion. Yep. But it does give you more variety. You have yep. more variety of cards, and uh, you can just do a little bit more with your hand with uh, with this expansion. It is a very small expansion, by the way, so you can just throw all of them in one box. Yeah, you can put it all in one box. Yep. Just this one game. Mm -hmm. But uh, that is the Cursed Horde expansion for Fantasy Realms. Yep.
Okay, so we are halfway through our four games. Uh, the third game that we are going to talk about is one that I was actually really excited for because I like the game that it's modeled after. And this was uh, Castles of Tuscany. Yes. This is a Steffenfeld design. It is uh, published by Aaliyah and Ravensburger here in the U.S. Uh, it's a two to four player game, and it's a kind of condensed version of the Castles of Burgundy, uh, if you're familiar with that game, mm -hmm. but it's got its own flair. Yes, like Naveen was mentioning, this is sort of uh, framed after the Castles of Burgundy, but they are not the same game. It has it borrows very similar concepts, Yes, but supposed to be condensed in a much uh, shorter, easier to, to digest version of yeah, the game. Yeah, even on the box here, it says uh, in terms of its like uh, thinkability, I guess, it's a three out of 10 in terms of heaviness. Oh, yeah. thinkability. I don't know, see, it's like a little light bulb. I didn't even notice like, that. Oh. <laughs> The way that this game specifically is played is everybody has their own three-piece hex that's supposed to be like your player board in Castles of Burgundy. Yeah. But this one, instead of dice, is we have cards. Right. Now the cards in this game are color-coded by region, and so they dictate where you'll be able to place tiles on your hex board. Mm -hmm. So on your turn, you can either draw cards, you can uh, take a tile from the center area to put onto your player board because you have to store them before right. you put them on your actual board, just like in Castles of Burgundy. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Or you can place a tile from your storage onto your your hex board by discarding cards from your hand right. that match the color of that tile. Exactly. I think you have to discard the uh, same color, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, same color that pertains to the region. Right. And so these tiles have bonuses um, that allow you to take certain resources, that allow you to kind of play a little bit better. And these bonuses come in the form of these tiles that kind of extend your player board mm -hmm. and allow you to take certain actions better. Like there's a tile that allows you to draw additional cards when you take that action. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little bit of like an engine buildy tableau buildy aspect to it. It's minor, but it's it there. And yep. that's not something that's in Castles of Burgundy. Right? No, not in Castles of Burgundy. But um, so this one, uh, th there's another interesting thing about it. There are two different scoring tracks in mm -hmm. this game. That is what <sighs> kind of like really sets it apart. Yeah, there's a there's a inner scoring track and an outer scoring track. The yes. outer scoring track is a cumulative scoring. Uh, the game is played over three different rounds. Uh, and so if in the first round you scored 20 points, then in the second round you are definitely scoring 20 points, meaning where you are on that first track will never change. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can only add to it. So it, the game kind of snowballs. Uh, so for that reason, there is a little bit of a potential runaway leader. Oh, it's not that little bit. It's quite a, <laughs> yeah. It's quite a, yeah. That, that's definitely a part of this game. Yeah, that first scoring track never resets. So if yes. you scored X amount of points in the first round, you're definitely scoring that in the next round, and of course in the third round. And so uh, if you kind of get a, a nice little lead at the, at the front end, uh, it's kind of tough to catch up. I, I haven't seen a, a game that we've played where anybody has caught up because of that. Yeah, so that is one of the kind of the gripes that we have yeah. with the game. In general, this does feel like a much shortened version of Castle of Burgundy. Like if you are looking for a smaller, uh, faster way to play that game, then this is probably the closest thing to it. Mm -hmm. But yes, there's that issue. There's also the issue of the rule book. The rule book yes. does not communicate how to actually play the game. Uh, the way that other versions of the game are played mm -hmm. around the world. I, right. don't, I think there was maybe, maybe like a translation issue. Yes, I believe some rule books in one language are completely different. Not completely, but there's there's rules like in, in the wording where it's, it can be interpreted one way versus mm -hmm. the other. So if you go and look at the German rule book, you translate a, se a sentence that you're confused about in the English rule book. You're like, wait, that's kind of opposite of what mm -hmm. we're talking about here. So uh, there's a little bit of confusion there as well. Yes. So that is Castles of Tuscany. It's a relatively light game, definitely between the two games, Castle of Burgundy or Castle of Tuscany. I'm 100% picking Castles of Burgundy over it. <laughs> uh, this one's okay. Uh, it's not my favorite game, obviously, uh, but uh, it has some elements that I do enjoy. Definitely the hand management and then building up your tableau on the side. Uh, those are the most interesting things. And of course, uh, the drawback for me is the uh, the double scoring board. How about yourself? <laughs> yeah. I think I liked it a little bit more than Naveen did, but it is also just okay for me. I would definitely choose Castle of Burgundy over it if I had the time, mm -hmm. but I know that that game can kind of uh, swing long, but I do like the accessible accessible part of this game. The fact that it's probably easier to get into and definitely shorter to play. Okay, and the final one that we want to talk about is Tiny Towns with the Villagers expansion here. Yes. So, go ahead and hang on to that. We this... had a plan to do a playthrough of we this did, yeah. like months ago, but right. we just weren't able to squeeze it in. Can do it, yeah. So the, we're, we're speaking specifically on the Villagers expansion. Right. I know that there have been a couple of expansions for this game, yeah, I think but so, yeah. just this one for today. Right. This is published by AEG and designed by, I think, uh, Peter McPherson. 
and, and Josh, Josh Wood, Wood for the Villagers for expansion. The villagers, yeah. yeah. If you're not familiar with the base game of Tiny Towns, this is a game where you're constructing a town. Uh, but yeah. it's, it's really tough, actually, because there are going to be cards laid out uh, on the table uh -huh. that are the buildings that you're allowed to construct, as well as the construction materials and the configuration that they need to be placed on your board in order to build that building. Right. But the, the big kicker in this game is that each round, one person is going to be the master builder who calls out a specific type of construction material yes. that everybody playing is required to place on their board. Right. So it might not be the construction material that you need, but you need to place it somewhere on your board. Right. You can you can choose where to place it. And so you're, you're gonna be doing this whole dance of like, well, maybe if I put it here in this corner, I can potentially build this building at a later date Yes. and all your plans get ruined and now you don't have any buildings on your board. Yeah, the, the city <laughs> planning management part is, yeah. is the most interesting part of the game. Um, it's very difficult sometimes when uh, you're getting the same resource over and over and it yes. has nothing to do with the building that you're trying to build. <laughs> so you start tucking it away into a corner and then it gets trapped. And then you find yourself having trouble, you know, further down the road in the game. Uh, your game can end before other people's. If yes. your uh, whole town gets kind of boxed in, uh, other people can continue to take turns and, and keep uh, kind of playing the game and right. you can just be sitting there. Because you essentially play until you have no more space on your board. Right. And so for Naveen and I, that happens quite early because yes. we're not good at this game. Yeah. Um, this is a title for us that I was definitely very, uh, very excited about when it very first came out. Mm -hmm. Like it, it came out before we started getting into content creation and right. I really, really wanted to play this game. And then kind of over time, this is kind of a, one of those games that had like diminishing returns yeah. after a while. Sure. So with the new expansion, which is the villagers expansion, you get these new little animal meeples and they're, they are villagers who are supposed to try to help you uh, build the buildings better, mm -hmm. I suppose. Each game you play with a couple of these cards that tell you what kind of action you can take with these villagers. Mm -hmm. And they're usually things like being able to construct a building using fewer resources, stuff like that. But in order to utilize these villagers, they have to be working in a building that you've constructed. And so to activate any of those abilities, you must discard a certain number of those villagers who are working in buildings. Mm -hmm. They can't just be anyone on your board. They have to be specifically in a building that you've built. Right, so you construct it on top of the building. Mm -hmm. The villager is now working in it, and then after a certain amount that you discard, then you can take the action. Yes. I liked the expansion because I felt like it made the game a little bit less frustrating. It gave me more options as to what I can do rather than just relying on my abstract planning on the board. Or your opponents who are just going to call out things that you're like, well, I'm not yes. working towards that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It also adds additional building cards that you can build, so, um, so that's nice to kind of spice things up. But I did kind of struggle with learning the specifics on how the villagers move on the board. Mm. Like there's some very specific rules about like, if you don't build a building in the same spot as the villager, then you have to move the villager into a different square. Mm -hmm. It's just a little bit, it was a little bit confusing to me. As to slightly how to fiddly these. in that sense. Yeah, slightly yeah. fiddly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, for me, the, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Tiny Towns in general. The first time I played it, like you said, the diminishing returns. This expansion, it definitely did enhance the game for mm -hmm. me, um, but it's yeah. still in that same Tiny Towns realm. I don't think I like the part of the game where the main mechanic of the master builder calling things <laughs> out, because I always find myself like on on at, at the beginning, like, okay, great, I like this this material, but right. then I'm no longer in control, especially in a four player game for three of the other turns. And so I'm just kind of like stuck with like, okay, I got this thing. I'm, I'm gonna try to build this. Oh, I guess plans change. And so- Okay, Naveen is not a fan of the heart the of the heart game. Of, yeah, the heart <laughs> of the game, the mechanics of the game, I'm not the biggest fan of. So then what you're trying to say is if you're not a big fan of Tiny Towns, this isn't gonna make you like it. That's what I think. Right? I, yeah, that's, in my Which opinion, I think expansions that. rarely change people's minds anyway. Right. But if you are a fan of Tiny Towns and you do enjoy that kind of base mechanic, uh, I imagine this will probably be uh, something fun for you because it does add more building cards and that alone is already kind of nice to have with this game mm -hmm. but the villagers just let you do things better and easier it just adds a little bit more strategy to your game yep. so that is tiny towns the villagers expansion and so if you're still watching thank you so much for getting this far in our first uh, segment this we is don't know like what we're a, doing yeah. an experimental episode sure and so just to kind of celebrate this first episode we are doing two giveaways one is for a copy of a tiny expansion for Tiny Towns called Tiny Trees. Yep. Now, we haven't played with this expansion before, but we know that it comes with uh, little tiny trees as well as little seeds. And so I believe the way that this works is each player starts with a seed on their board. Yes. If it is still there at the end of the game with no other empty spaces, then 
you it grows into a tree and the tree is worth two points. two points otherwise you can still build on that space and you gain an additional resource for doing so yeah. that is how you play with this in a nutshell um it does require the base game in order to use it because this is not a game on its own yep. but uh, because of that reason we are going to bundle it with a copy of point salad and so this is a game we're not reviewing it right now no. but i really like this game it's silly yeah it's silly mm -hmm. it's about collecting vegetable cards and uh it's really fun yeah it's so mm -hmm. this is the first thing that we're giving away uh the next one we're going to give away is a copy of the mind some people yes. call it a game some people don't call it a game <laughs> uh we it's love fun. it we like it uh, yeah. so we like to give it away yes now uh, all the details about the giveaway are all in the description below yeah. unfortunately this is us only we did mention all of those public those uh, shipping issues in the beginning of the video so we're gonna have to keep it to us only this time but uh we thank you all for making it this far uh, if you'd like to see anything specific in this segment that maybe we didn't cover or you'd just like to see in the future, please go ahead and leave a comment down below. Like we're mentioning, this is experimental, but totally. uh, we are going to try to keep doing this at least once a month. We'll try to figure out what we're doing mm -hmm. very soon. So thank you all so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please consider subscribing. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.